Father, you are the promise keeper. You are the promise keeper, Lord. You're the miracle worker. You touch our lives, Lord. You mend in our lives, Lord. And you change our lives for the better. So thank you for these brothers gathering together today, Lord. Touch our hearts, Lord, with your word, Lord, and speak to us today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Listening to the words of those worship songs are very... Uh, uh, encouraging, you know, and here we are the, uh, all together, and 
the Bible says where two or more are gathered, of course, he is here. So he is here. Okay? <laughs> now, the Holy Spirit is here in us for those who accepted Christ as their Savior. And he's here leading us and teaching us. And one thing I like about the Holy Spirit, there's never a blanket statement. You know, when somebody comes up and says something, you know, everybody take it as it is. No. The Holy Spirit gives it to each person as he needs to hear it individually. You know, we all need, we all think differently. We're all in the Lord, of course. But the Holy Spirit makes sure you get it the way you need it. And he does this simultaneously. It's amazing to me. It's one thing listening and following and reading the minds and hearts of seven, almost eight billion people on the earth simultaneously. So it's just it's good to know that the Lord is here. Hallelujah. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> He's my God, you know. Anyway, we got to talk about our speaker here. He's going to talk about our government and our government and the Lord's government, government in general. Welcome Randy Sorley, please. I've titled today's talk, Government Control. And I'm going to go through three parts of government control. I'm going to talk a little bit about world government just real shortly. Then I'm going to go into Israel. Israel had it all, yet they divided their kingdom into two sections, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And then I'm going to go verse by verse through our scripture today, finishing with the zeal of the Lord, because he has a passion for you, for each and every one of you, to redeem you and to save you. This book right here contains 66 books within this book, totaling 31,107 verses of the Bible. And it points to one name and two events. That name is Jesus Christ. The two events are the first coming of Jesus Christ and the future second coming of Jesus Christ. Within this book, there's the book of Isaiah. It consists of 66 chapters and it's considered a book within a book. It has 1,292 verses in this book. And it points to one name and two events. That's Jesus Christ, the first coming, and the future second coming. Our verse, two verses for today, have or point to one name and two events. Jesus Christ and the first and second coming of Jesus Christ. Some of you may uh, know the name George Putnam. He was a KTLA uh, TV commentator or newscast, newscaster. And he would give one reporter's opinion during some of his broadcasts. Today I'm going to start out with somewhat of a lengthy commentary. However, the gentleman or female who created this, wrote this, did not pin their name with it as well. You may have heard it, but here it goes. A democracy is always temporary in nature. It simply cannot exist as a permanent form of government. A democracy will continue to exist up until the time that voters discover that they can vote themselves generous gifts from the public treasury. From that moment on, 
the majority always votes for the candidate who will promise the most benefits from the public treasury, with the result that every democracy will finally collapse over loose fiscal policy, which is always followed by a dictatorship. The author goes on to say that the average age of the world's greatest civilizations from the beginning of history has been about 200 years. During those 200 years, these nations always progressed through the following sequence. From bondage to spiritual faith, from spiritual faith to great courage, from courage to liberty, from liberty to abundance, from abundance to complacency, and from complacency to apathy. From apathy to dependence, from dependence back into bondage. Benjamin Franklin is quoted as saying that without God's aid, the Founding Fathers would succeed in the political building, in this political building, meaning the White House and the government, no better than, no better than the builders of Babel. At the outset of the Revolutionary War, Benjamin Franklin reminded delegates that they had prayed daily and often for divine protection. He concluded by asking this question, and have we now forgotten that powerful friend? That brings us to our two Bible verses for today. If you'll stand with me as I read the word of God, I would appreciate it. You'll find it in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 to 7. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Let's pray. Lord God, I just uh, lift you up that your zeal for us is eternal, and you will accomplish that. And I just pray that this word would go out and just adhere to each and every man here today. In your name, amen. amen. You may be seated. The nation of Israel, known as the 12 tribes, experienced firsthand that powerful friend that Benjamin Franklin referred to. That powerful friend was Yahweh, commonly referred to as Jehovah. Jehovah provided food and protection throughout their sojourning to discover the promised land. Jehovah was a cloud by day and a fire at night as they trekked, carrying the Ark of the Covenant. Jehovah provided angelic protection as they defeated their adversaries who rose up against them. Have you ever asked yourself why and when the Israelites, the Jews, splintered into two nations? They became discontented with their Lord. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, the elders of Israel gathered and demanded these are the elders gathered and demanded that Samuel make them a king to judge them like all other nations, to go out before them and fight their battles. In 1050 BC, Israel relinquished their leadership of Jehovah for their first king, King Saul. King David and King Solomon soon followed before splintering for 120 years later into two kingdoms called Israel and Judah. Israel, whose capital is Samaria, became the northern kingdom consisting of 10 tribes. Judah, whose capital was Jerusalem, became the southern kingdom consisting of the tribes 
of Judah and Benjamin, each division with their own ruler or king. The prophet Isaiah's literal name is Yahweh is salvation. Prophets of this era were unique and many rulers despised them because they spoke the word of the Lord to them. Many prophets were murdered and Isaiah was no exception as he was later sawed in half by King Manasseh. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah was commissioned by God and received a message from God when the, or the Lord asked him this question, whom will I send and who will go before us? This us is the Trinity of God. Isaiah responded, here I am, send me. Or more literally in the Hebrew, behold me, send me. The Lord directed Isaiah to go and tell the kingdom of Judah, who the Lord described as deaf and blind, that they would be annihilated in the future by the Babylonians. But by the end of chapter 6, Isaiah described a remnant, a small portion of Israelites who would survive through a holy seed, a holy people whom the Lord their God had chosen for himself above all the other peoples on the face of this earth. There were four kings that ruled the southern kingdom of Judah, and with King Ahaz being the first and most wicked, vile, and ungodly of the four. Second Kings chapter 16 states, King Ahaz made idols of the pagan god Moloch and even sacrificed his own sons, believing Moloch would provide more pleasure in his life. In Isaiah chapter 7, the prophet Isaiah shared a word of prophecy from the Lord to King Ahaz that a virgin would conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, many times referred to as the Emmanuel prophecy. King Ahaz flippantly and defiantly refused to heed this, that prophecy. Chapter 8 ends with a prophecy of the southern kingdom being driven into darkness. However, chapter 9 begins with, Nevertheless, those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, a light will shine. That light begins our text, for unto us a child is born. This child being born is Jesus Christ, the promised Messiah, before you can have a birth, you need seed, and that seed is found in Genesis 3, when the Lord had a conversation with Satan and Eve that, that he would put hatred between Satan's seed and Eve's seed. While this seed has a biological connotation, neither can have seed. Why? Because Satan is a spirit created by God. And Eve, well, she can't biologically produce seed. Therefore, these two seeds refer primarily to spiritual progeny, or more specifically, the descendants or genealogy. This is a prophecy of the coming Messiah, and thus the genealogy of the coming Messiah begins in Genesis and continues through Revelation. This birth shows Jesus, Jesus' humanity. Before I, I used to go scuba diving off of Laguna Beach at 2 a.m. in the morning for lobsters. I purchased myself a full-blown head-to-toe wetsuit to keep myself secure in those elements. Jesus donned a similar covering in the form of skin that stretches and forms to our body while providing protection from the elements. Why would the Messiah do this? He did it for two reasons. One to save us, and one to redeem us from eternal death. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. This son is a gift from the Father of lights, and his son's deity and divinity is revealed. 
Remember when Nathaniel asked Philip, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Luke 4 recounts Jesus' return to his birth town of Nazareth when he was 30 years old and beginning his ministry. It was custom to go to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and this day was Jesus' turn to read the scripture. Jesus was given the scroll of Isaiah to begin reading where they had ended from the week before. What a prophetic thing there. Right where they left off, Jesus gets to start speaking. In Isaiah chapter 61, Jesus reads, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus then sat down, and that's a sign of being like a priest, a teacher, would do in those days. And the eyes of everyone were upon him. That's only five seconds of quiet time of looking. Then Jesus broke that silence and said, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your healing. What Jesus just revealed to everyone in the synagogue was that he was the Messiah. And they only marveled at his gracious words. Then they started asking among themselves, well, who's his daddy? Well, that's my term there. They were asking, is this not Joseph's son really saying or commentating about Jesus having an illegitimate birth genealogy? Then Jesus stated, and he caught their attention with this comment, and many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the, the Syrian. What Jesus just said there, the Jews abhorred. Why? Because the Jewish leopards of Israel rejected the healing. However, the Gentile leper, Naaman, believed and was healed. The Bible states that after the healing from Jesus, the Jews were filled with wrath, they were, and they rose up, and they thrust Jesus out of the city to throw him off a cliff. And a divine gauntlet opened, and Jesus walked through that gauntlet, through that crowd, and went on his way. For unto us a child is born, fulfilled prophecy. Unto us a son is given, fulfilled prophecy. And the government will be upon his shoulders, future predictive prophecy. There is no direct Hebrew word for government that is translated into our English language. However, the word used here means to rule or dominion. The Apostle John pens a similar birth in a vision he had in Revelation chapter 12. This future predictive prophecy is about a pregnant woman, a child, and a dragon. The woman is the nation of Israel. The child is Jesus Christ, and the dragon is Satan. In this vision, Satan was there to devour her child as soon as it was born. However, the Messiah child was caught up to God and his throne before Satan had a chance to murder him. This child was destined, was destined to rule all nations with a rod of iron as king of kings and lord of lords. 
sitting on the throne with his father. This text that we're reading here changes gears to describe four attributes of Jesus. They begin with wonderful counselor. The term wonderful literally means incomprehensible. Jesus Christ is incomprehensible counselor who is a wise king and full of wisdom. He is a mighty God who is fully God and fully man. He became one of us without ceasing to be himself a powerful warrior. He is our everlasting father, a king and father who provides for, who provides for and protects his people forever. And he is the prince of peace, the one who has the right to reign and who will usher in peace, unity, and accord. But the deeper, more foundational meaning of peace is the spiritual harmony brought about by an individual's restoration with God. These four double names combine aspects of Jesus' deity and his humanity. Together, these four double names assert the dual nature of our Savior. He is God become man. Verse 7 begins with, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice, judgment and justice, from that time forward, even forever. Jesus will increase as a peaceful reign. The risen Lord Jesus brings his rule of peace to the believer's heart in the present age. He will establish the kingdom of God, which will be his reign of peace. This child will occupy the throne of God, fulfilling the Davidic covenant and God's promise to David. Verse 7 ends with, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. My favorite verse here out of all of them. Zeal can be defined as focused desire characterized by passion and commitment. Isaiah lived in a day where there was nothing but corruption in government. The nation had wandered from God. Even God's church no longer seemed to love the Lord nor his word. But God was not giving up and never gives up on us. Zeal is defined as enthusiastic devotion to a cause, an ideal, or a goal with tireless diligence in its furtherance. The Lord of hosts is a war title of God. The Lord is Yahweh and hosts are angelic armies. This verse could easily read the zeal of the angelic armies of Yahweh will perform this. It is with zeal that God reaches out to humanity to save us. It is with zeal that the Lord of hosts comes to do battle with evil, with Satan, and with sin. It is with zeal that God enters humanity, broken humanity. Human government can never survive because of our sin nature. There's only a government of one that can and will survive. Chuck Smith referred to it as a theocracy, better known as the second coming of Jesus Christ. Thank you for your time. I do have one sidebar I'd like to talk about. There's a, a movie called The Chosen. How many have seen this, The Chosen? If you have not seen this, you gotta see it. And the reason I bring this up is I was, as I was preparing my study, there's a scene in season two where Jesus heals a leper. 
And you see the, the facial expressions, which I'm sure Jesus had, of compassion for us. And it's, it's really interesting that this series came out, and it's called, um, what I call it? The Chosen. The Chosen. I went to a sit-down dinner. I was invited to a sit-down dinner at Biola University. And we had Noah James at our table. That's Andrew in the movie. And they had a bunch of actors there, and we got to intertwine with them, to communicate with them and talk with them during this dinner. And most of the actors in this movie are not Christians. But they're having this vision of Christ through this movie. And it's interesting because I've watched the series, there's two series, it's free, it streams, there's an app on your phone. You can put it up on your big screen or you can watch it in a, uh, at LAX before you board a plane, it's great. But it's just a terrific thing to watch, it really is. And as I was watching it for the third time, each time I watched it, I would point to something, a Bible verse in the Bible, obviously, that would come out of there. And it would become real on the screen to see how the disciples may have acted, how Jesus' passion for us is revealed. This is a bona fide class A movie. The actors are superb. The streaming is 4K, it's clear. And it's the most realistic thing that I personally have ever witnessed on Jesus Christ just because of that. And I would highly recommend that if you haven't seen it to watch it and to watch it multiple times. It's kind of like reading the Bible, right? We read the Bible, and for say, let's say the fifth time through, you go, I never saw that before. Same thing with this movie. I never realized that Jesus had a personality, that he actually liked to joke and say things and do things. He was one of us just like the scripture says. And I thank you again for your devotion for this, uh, this, this Bible study and this Friday meeting. Thank you. One thing that came across really good was that Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man, wa what I saw was the man. And he had so much compassion in a godly way. And he was just a normal guy. He didn't have... Uh, a place to stay. He had his little pup tent out in the woods, started a little fire, made food, you know. He was just a survivor, a survivalist, I guess you could say. They got a lot of that going on today. But it was very personal because he was very human. And he, he was fully God as well. And I'm looking at all of y'all and, and I'm thinking, we have God in us. We're not fully God, we're fully man, <laughs> but God is in us and he is fully God, you know. So we are equipped, we are equipped to go out there and bring light onto the this dark, dark world. Um, I, I want to um, pray for, he just left, uh, Bob uh, Gascon. He just got over pneumonia, him and his wife Kathy. And um, he, was, he was hurting, sitting in there, falling asleep. He's just so tired and beat up. Um, yeah, he wasn't going to stick around. He's got to go to bed. Uh, but I do want to lift up um, our friend Joe Campos back here. Uh, his sister, Tina. Tina Johnson. Um, she's had neck surgeries. She's had knee replacement. Then she's fallen and bruised ribs. I'm not sure if she broke her ribs. If there's anything that's hard to recover from, 
its ribs, broken or bruised. I've gone through that. Uh, you don't reach this age without having a face plant now and then. But as I'm going on six weeks, and it's still uh, pretty sore. So my heart's out for her, Tina. I just want to keep her in my prayers, keep her in your prayers that she can recover from this. And so let me pray. Father God, we thank you so very much for being our God and allowing us to be your children, your chosen. We thank you for the love that you've uh, expressed here today and uh, being in this place, serving us the food you have provided, having a wonderful worship team lifting up your name and, uh, and guiding us in that great, great worship uh, and just filling us with your spirit. We are so blessed, Father God. We want to lift up uh, Tina Johnson and uh, Bob Gascon and anybody else who has a prayer request. Lift them up, Father, for healing and a quick recovery, dear God. Uh, bless us as we go out into this world and, uh, and be the courageous Christian that we need to be and know that you are with us. Like I said, you told us through Joshua, you are with us wherever we go. So God bless us, Lord God, and thank you for all you've done for us and all that you will do because you're with us always. Thank you in Jesus' name. Have a good day, my friends. Have a good day.